Good morning. Today we're going to look at the foundational theories in environmental psychology. This will be an introduction to the theories so that we can understand how researchers look into environmental psychology issues. The theories in environmental psychology exclusively examines the relationship between humans and their environments. And as I said before, we have to look at the total environment, not just one portion or one aspect. We have to look at the total environment, what is happening on every single level. On the whole, men try to remedy physical and social issues with pharmaceuticals, surgery, and person-to-person -person therapies instead of looking at the environment as a cause, such as you may go to bed each night, every morning you get up and you have a headache, and you think, oh, I'm just not sleeping good, or uh, I'm bothered about something, but it could be the way your neck is positioned on your pillow. It could be that your bed is not right for you, or it's old and it's breaking down and it needs to be replaced. There's other issues that need to be looked at rather than just saying, I didn't sleep, I was bothered about something. We have to look at the total environment. What is causing the problem? Then start eliminating things as we find out that they're maybe not uh, causing any issues. As I said, we must look at the total envelope that could cause any of these problems and then eliminate those things. As designers, we must consider the environment as a covariable in prevention and compensation and reject the magic bullet approach. The magic bullet approach is used by most other researchers in different fields. And this is when you look at one variable, one thing that could happen, and if it doesn't work, then you say, oh, that's not the cause. Well, you can't do that with environmental research. You've got to look at lighting. You've got to look at air conditioning, the fenestration. You've got to look at every single thing in that, in that environment. It's very, very important that we do not look at one thing, but we look at all things. Isidore Chen has, has a quote that is really true, and it's very unfortunate. Perhaps one of the most outstanding weaknesses of con contemporary psychological theory is the relative neglect of the environment by many of the most influential theoretical viewpoints. Many people do not look at the entire environment. They look at one or two things, maybe, and then they say, oh, well, that's not working, or that's not true, or what? You can't do that, not in this type of research. It's much more comprehensive. Okay, what is cause and effect? Cause and effect occur when there's high stimulation levels from the combined effect of the environment and social situations that are disproportionate to the environmental loads. Stimulation is the combined effect of the environment and social situations. Environmental load is the quantity and the intensity of the environmental elements. We can look at the three images below and see a representation of this. Many times people will say that they have headaches when they go to the office or they're working on their computer, they'll, they'll get headaches. And for many years, our monitors had really glossy screens on them, which caused glare if the lighting fixture reflected onto that or light that was coming in from a window reflected on that. It caused glare. So one of the things that the manufacturers did in receiving all these complaints is they put the matte finish on the monitors instead of having the glossy finish. I know many of our laptop screens are still the high gloss and you get that high reflective quality from that finish. But when they made this change with the monitors, the negative effect of that glare causing headaches greatly diminished. So therefore, we've identified the cause and we have an effect. And they changed the product 
so that the cause was diminished and the effect was then also diminished. This is what we're talking about. If you've got a high stimulation level that is from one source or several sources and it's affecting a situation, a physical situation in an environment, then you've got to look at it and find out what's going on and see if there's any changes that can be made. Sometimes it's even where the lighting is placed above a desk that can make a huge impact on the effect of the glare on that monitor. If we study well in our lighting courses how to configure the lighting in offices, then this is going to help also. But m people don't understand that. So when you get to your lighting course, make sure that you take into consideration what I've said here. Because we do not want to cause the environments that we design to have negative effects on the people that use them on a daily basis. If we ignore these things and we just design randomly, then we are going to have complaints. We don't want the complaints. We want people happy and satisfied. Environmental psychologists speak in terms of theories that help to conceptualize the human environment relationship. Everything we do is about humans in their relationship to the environment that they live, work, or play within, and how that environment impacts those human beings. We talk in terms of theoretical concepts. These theoretical concepts do not provide us with answers. They literally guide the research that generates the knowledge that then will help us to understand how to design. If we will base much of our design work on the research that's been done, we will correct many things that we would normally do wrong if we would just go back and look and see what research has been done on these specific things that we're, we're concerned about. However, many designers don't even know to do this. You will know to do this. So I hope you will do this when you get into real practice. You will go back, even in your projects, you need to do some research to see what is out there, what research is out there that will impact the, what you're working on. That is part of the case studies. Uh, sometimes you just go to one case study that is somebody's already done it. But what you really need to do is go in and look at the research that's been done on specific problems that you have within your research. Here are some important definitions that we need to know. Theory is a collection of ideas that is intended to explain something. Knowledge is facts, information, and skills that are acquired through experience or education. Knowledge is theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. What is an hypothesis? It is a, a proposed explanation that must be proven or disproven in order to establish a theory. Culture. This is very important. All of them are important, but culture is, and tradition are very important. Culture is the value, norms, and artifacts of a group of people. Tradition is a custom or practice that has been passed down from generation to generations. And we'll talk about all of these more in the future. Research in environmental psychology is rooted in scientific methods that are related to the acquisition of theory, pursuit of knowledge, and practical application. The only reason we do research is to find out more. We need more knowledge about what is going on and then how we apply it in a real life experience. Many times theory is used as knowledge, which is not good because it causes us to have a blurred vision of what we're doing. It's not, it's not based on truth. It's based on a supposition, a maybe. It's hypothetical. It's not real. So we don't need to base anything on theory. We need to find out truth about it. Knowledge is the truth that has been researched, and that is what we base our design work on. 
Theory are ideas that guide the research. If we didn't have the theories, then we wouldn't have a reason to do research. That is why we do the research. Okay, let's let's talk about bullfights for a minute. <clears throat> it was long believed that the bull ran after the red cape because of the color. However, bulls are colorblind. All animals are colorblind. So it was not the red cape. They could use a green cape, a white cape, a black cape, a pink cape. They could use any color cape, and the bull would run after it, not because of the color, but because of the movement of the cape. It's like a cat when you have a, a kitten and you're playing with it and you're moving a ball on a, on a string or something, and the cat will follow it and play with it and slap at it. It's the same thing with the bull. They're going after the movement. However, this practice is horrible. The bullfighting itself is horrible in that they use these spears to poke in the back of the neck of the bull until they're dead. And it's, it's gory and it's horrible. We need to understand the facts. We don't need to suppose that this is why. We need to understand, especially when we're doing interior environments for people that will live in them, play in them, work in them for days on end. Knowledge versus theory. In the situation of the bull, the red cape causes the bull to charge. The knowledge is animals are colorblind, so the color has nothing to do with the reason the bull charges. It is the movement of the cape that causes the bull to charge. The matadors continue using bright colored color capes out of culture, which is the values, norms, and artifacts of a group of people, and tradition, which is the custom or practice that has been passed down from generation to generation. Now, in the uproar about stopping bullfights, people don't want to stop it because it is a tradition. Many times, traditions are more important than culture. Let me, let me go a little bit farther with this one. When you guys decide to get married and you marry, there are two families coming together in that situation. Your family may do things a little bit differently than his family. Even though y'all know each other, you have the same faith, you have the same likes, dislikes, but there's things you do within your households that are different than the other ones. And when these two families come together in marriage, you guys are going to have to say, okay, what is what do we want to carry forward from my family and what do we carry forward from your family? Now, it may not be that overt, but you will do it. I know when Amy and Addis got married, my daughter and son-in-law, we had some customs, some traditions that we did at Christmas time. Addis's family didn't do that. But for Amy, it was very important that she carry those traditions forward. So therefore, she said, you know, this is what we do. Is it okay with you? And he said, yeah, sure. That sounds like fun. And so they decided as a team to move those traditions forward. Our culture may say one thing, but the tradition many times is a lot stronger than what your culture says. So how did this human behavior happen? Through the centuries, men and women tend to embrace the variables until they prove them harmful or inconvenient. In other words, people will continue to do something until it becomes harmful, they don't like it, they find out there's another way to do it, they change. They will continue to do it until, basically, until it becomes harmful. When I was younger, I wore high heels, loved them. I loved high heels. I loved getting dressed up and walking in those high heels. Now that I'm older, I don't want to be anywhere around them, especially not in them, because I would probably fall down. 
change, as circumstances change in our lives, we change the things that we're doing for our safety. For others' safety, we may change something. And and many times we'll we'll get involved in this stuff and, and we're like, why didn't I think about this before? Why didn't I make this change before? But it wasn't until you hit an obstacle where you couldn't go around it unless there was change that had to be done. Change is important. We have to realize that wherever there is life, there is change. I know one thing that we as designers need to understand is when you're working with an aging adult, you need to understand that they don't walk like most of you do. You will pick up your feet. They tend to shuffle their feet. They don't pick their feet up as high. So therefore, what happens is if there's a little tiny minute change in a a floor surface, they're going to stump their toe on it and fall down. When an older adult falls and breaks a hip, 99% of the time they don't recover. They will never get out of the bed after that fall. And it's not because they can't. It's because they're afraid to. And when a person stays in bed, they develop bed sores and pneumonia can develop quickly. When pneumonia develops, the lung capacity is decreased and they basically drown in their own fluid because they cannot breathe. We as designers must understand that through life changes, our bodies change, our functioning change, everything changes. And we have got to be aware of that and design appropriately for that population that we're working with. It is imperative that we do this. We look at this as a user perspective. If we're gonna have knowledgeable designs, it is based on our experience, our perception, and that is what we understand, what we know, and behavior. So we've got to look at all three of these issues so that we can base our designs on knowledge. If we see something and we don't understand it, then maybe we need to do some research. In part two, we're going to look at tools, to incorporate environmental psychology into different design fields, how we do that, and then also the research method and tools used in environmental psychology research. I will see you then, and have a good day and study hard. Thank you.